Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Kathy Overturf of Campus Ministry and Gina Duffy of Falvey Library for inviting me to give this talk. I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, they've given me to speak about a subject of great urgency, uh, but about which I really don't normally get a lot of time to reflect. Uh, and while thinking about the topic, my, my thoughts turned more and more to tolerance. Uh, and my remarks this afternoon will be as much, if not more, about that as they'll be about intolerance. Uh, in fact, as I hope to show, the two things bear a closer relationship than you might think, uh, which is a reason to step back from both of them. Which leads to my opening joke. It's about a Catholic uh, who assures his Protestant friend that there are indeed many ways to worship God, you in your way and I in his. That should clue you in uh, to some of the ironies and the difficulties that I'll be discussing this afternoon. The rise of religious animosity and violence throughout the world is certainly alarming and reprehensible, but I don't believe the tolerance is the antidote. Indeed, I think tolerance is frankly disingenuous, it's condescending, it's subtly coercive, and I think that it's even inimical uh, to the receptivity and open-mindedness that it purports to reflect. So in my wariness of tolerance, uh, I'm going to make four claims this afternoon. First, the tolerance is an element, in fact, it's an indispensable element, in the architecture of the nation state and of capitalism, two of modernity's most powerful, coercive, and violent forces, both allegedly secular, but both of which also harbor some unmistakably religious qualities. Second, I'm going to be claiming that the increase in religious intolerance over the last three decades is bound up with the triumph of that global capitalism and the demise of a secular nationalism that was also wrought by that triumph. Third, I'm going to be arguing that religious tolerance, and that's in quotes, is not the remedy for intolerance because it is neither possible nor desirable. Not only have there always been and always will be limits to what liberal democratic societies will tolerate, but tolerance itself obscures and disrespects the very religious difference it supposedly protects and affirms. And fourth, I'm going to claim that the only way to truly respect religious difference, engage in authentic conversation, and even to discover new possibilities within one's own religious tradition, is to create a new kind of multicultural religious, multi-religious culture characterized by engagement, charity, patience and humility, not this bland and patronizing indifference we call tolerance. Such a way of navigating religious difference, I think, is at once more honest and it's more genuinely open-minded than the counterfeit magnanimity we call tolerance. Now let me first say, before you all get scared, there's a lot to be said for tolerance. As I'll show, it emerged as a way to curb the terrifying religious violence of the 16th and 17th centuries religious violence that we who live in liberal democracies have never witnessed or had to endure, or so we think. I'm thankful to John Locke and to other proponents of tolerance that I can live peaceably with my Presbyterian neighbors across the street, as well as with my more conservative evangelical neighbors whose belief in, in biblical literalism I consider, well, frankly, silly. And I have to say that I don't share the wounded vanity of many conservative Christians in this country who feel oh so beleaguered and even persecuted when what they're really experiencing is disagreement or demographic and cultural transformation. White Christians and especially, and especially evangelical Protestants ha are used to being in charge in America and many of them think that the erosion of their cultural authority augurs nothing less than the end of the world. Hence the popularity of end time speculation or the sanctimonious gore that you see in these left behind novels or the ignorant derision of Islam and other religions that are supposedly unwelcome in what we've traditionally thought of as a Christian nation. So therefore it would seem that casting doubt and aspersion on tolerance can, isn't just flippant, but it's irresponsible. Especially over the last decade, we've witnessed a Pentecost of intolerance as the furies of religious antipathy have broken loose all over the world. In Sri Lanka and Myanmar, Buddhist monks have encouraged and even taken part in attacks on mosques and Muslim individuals and have demanded that Muslims relocate to Bangladesh. In Pakistan, the government's flirtation with the Taliban has led to increased pressure on more moderate Muslims and on Christians, 
many of whom are now demanding uh, a separate province so that they can protect themselves. In Indonesia, Sunni, Shia, and Sufi Muslims have engaged in brutal struggles with each other, as well as with Christians and Buddhists, and atheists have been jailed after being beaten, usually by Muslims, but also by Christians. Fear of intolerance is a, is a factor in the current civil war in Syria, where many, if not most, Christians support Bashar al-Assad because they fear that a rebel victory will usher in an Islamist government. In Switzerland, the construction of minarets has been banned since 2009. In France, the wearing of the hijab or other ostentatious religious garb, it's a word in the legislation, has been prohibited since 2003. In the Netherlands, right-wing populist Geert Wilders is one of the most popular politicians in the country, calling for attacks on women who wear the hijab, a halt to Muslim immigration to Europe, and resistance to the rise of what he and other Christian <coughs> ideologues have called Eurabia. The most atrocious example yet of European religious bigotry has of course been Anders Breivik, who in July 2011 slaughtered 69 people at a youth camp near Oslo. In a manifesto explaining his carnage that he posted on the internet just hours before his killing spree, entitled 2083, A European Declaration of Independence, Breivik cooked up this rancid stew of religious paranoia, lumping together Islam, feminism, and Marxism into this unholy trinity of blasphemy against Christianity. And despite its own vaunted history of religious freedom, the United States has not been immune from this resurgence of intolerance. According to a report published by the Pew Research Center in 2012, there's been a spike in violence and other malicious acts motivated by religious bigotry. The report documents numerous instances of individuals being prevented from wearing religious attire, religious groups experiencing difficulty in obtaining zoning permits to build or expand places of worship or schools or other facilities, and complaints of workplace harassment and discrimination based on religion. It goes without saying that Islam has borne the brunt of this religious hysteria. Recall in 2010 the acrid controversy over Cordoba House a projected Islamic cultural center near Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan. In North Carolina and Oklahoma, which are, I guess are now two of the nuttiest states in the Union, state legislatures have taken the preemptive step, this is the word they use, of banning Sharia law. Big threat in North Carolina and Oklahoma, Sharia law. And the most incendiary outburst, and I do mean incendiary, came from one Reverend Terry Jones a Florida pastor who burned a copy of the Koran on the grounds of his church. It really pains me that this man shares a name with a member of the Monty Python troupe. It's, it's awful. <clears throat> now one explanation of the new religious turmoil emphasizes poverty, unemployment, destitution, and injustice, all of which compose a combustible compound of rage that's ignited by this torch of religious chauvinism. Another sort focuses on cult cultural anxiety. Witness Brevik's call for the restoration of a European Christendom or the religious right in the United States, much of which is a response to the slow senescence of Protestant cultural authority. Even broader explanations in, ex explain the rise in religious intolerance as something called a reaction against modernity, two features of which are not just greater secularism, but also greater cultural and religious heterogeneity. In this view, intolerant fundamentalists are attempting to stem or reverse the triumph of liberal democracy, consumer culture, urbanization, science, technological development, the erosion of patriarchal sexual mores and family relations. Then, hence, the only remedy for religious intolerance then would seem to be the embrace or the forcible victory of modernity and the adoption of liberal democratic norms of tolerance by intolerant or fundamentalist religious groups. Now while I think there's much of value in these explanations, I do challenge the idea that tolerance is the only and even the obvious way of preventing religious differences from issuing in bigotry and persecution and violence. For one thing, religious tolerance has been bound up with the development of liberal democratic capitalism, which has, any, has been anything but peaceful, voluntary, and respectful of cultural and religious difference. In fact, the genealogy of religious toleration reveals that tolerance has served not to achieve a secular peace among religious groups, 
but to sacralize two institutions, namely the market and the nation state, which have always depended on violence for their creation and for their maintenance. Religious tolerance has been part of an effort to get us to render unto Caesar and Mammon, as well as God, with no sense of incongruity or contradiction. Now, what I'm going to do now is give you the familiar story of religious tolerance in Europe and <coughs> elsewhere, and it goes something like this. Once upon a time, the history of religion was characterized by savage parochialism and fear. So even though Christ told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world, later Christians, and especially the Emperor Constantine, came to believe that the church must be a pillar of culture and civilization. Hence what some theologians have dubbed Constantinianism, the conviction that Christianity is not just the good news of salvation, but an indispensable buttress of social and political order, and that Caesar must work in tandem with God. Epitomized by the Inquisition, intolerance of heretics and infidels was considered both essential to social harmony and conformable to the will of divinity. Alas, even Christians couldn't keep their act together, as in the 16th and 17th centuries, Europe was racked by religious wars triggered by the Protestant Reformation. These wars pitted Protestants against Catholics, neighbor against neighbor, in ferocious religious homicide, exemplified by the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572 and the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century. Inflamed by religious zeal, otherwise decent people could be induced to slit their neighbor's throats or burn them at the stake over the nature of the Eucharist, the status of the papacy, or the meaning of some obscure biblical passage. Now by the mid-17th century, so the story continues, a growing number of writers of every religious persuasion who were weary of these battles, Jean Baudin, John Milton, John Locke, proposed tolerance as a way to end the slaughter, maintain social peace, and even, some of them contended, do the will of God. Take John Locke's Letter Concerning Toleration, published in 1689, in which he attempted, in his words, to, quote, distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion. Civil government, Locke argued, properly concerns itself with what he calls civil interests, life, liberty, and health, and indolency of body, and outward things, as he calls them, these are Locke's words, such as money, lands, houses, furniture, and the like. Religion, on the other hand, properly concerns itself with, quote, public worship of God and salvation or the acquisition of eternal life, end quote. Among religious groups, Locke emphasizes, quote, nothing ought nor can be transacted relating to the possession of civil and worldly goods, end quote. Given this division of labor, people cannot be constrained to worship against their wills, either by the civil magistrate or by the clergyman. Civil government to Locke should not concern itself with religion, except in the cases of Catholics and atheists, exceptions whose significance I'm going to return to a little later. Now, I want to underscore two things here. First of all, religious tolerance was invented by religious believers. Locke was a devout Protestant, and he clearly states in the very first sentence of the letter concerning toleration, quote, tolerance is the chief characteristic mark of the true church. What we normally think of, therefore, as the secularization of government, right, part of which entails religious tolerance, was first proposed in the West on religious grounds. And ironically enough, on the grounds of a very particular Protestant Christianity. Tolerance is, therefore, a covert form of Constantinianism, another way in which Christians, precisely through renouncing claims to state coercion, still presuppose a Christian foundation for social and political order. Second, Locke's support for toleration rests on a view of, of religion as essentially internal and private and therefore somehow irrelevant to the public world of politics and property. Thus, the political form that we've come to call the nation state and the political tradition that we've come to call liberalism 
Both emerged in part as ways to keep religious believers from torching, beheading, and disemboweling each other. In short, so Locke argues, you can't trust religious groups to play nice and police themselves. They need the state to act as a neutral, secular overseer and to bridle the inclination they all share to dominate others. Now, I don't think this story is so much false as I think it's incomplete. There's another less well-known text that captures something essential about the connection of tolerance in the nation state. And that's the chapter on civil religion in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract, where Rousseau asserts quite bluntly that, quote, no state has ever been founded without a religious basis. Now that sounds as though that would preclude tolerance. But the genius in the entire chapter is how Rousseau turns this into the foundation for tolerance. Rousseau was a great admirer of the Romans and especially their policy toward the gods of subject peoples. After conquering a city, Rousseau writes, the Romans, quote, left the vanquished their gods as they left them their laws. All they required as tribute, besides the money, of course, was a wreath to Jupiter, a token deference to Rome's imperial cult. Rousseau recommends a similar policy to the founders of modern states. Recognizing the post-Reformation possibility of creedal diversity within a single nation, Rousseau calls for what he, calls for what he, he terms a civil religion that ties, quote, divine worship to a love of the law that makes the homeland the object of a citizen's adoration and that anoints the service of the state as the service of God. Those are Rousseau's words. From this standpoint, particular religions should be allowed to flourish as long as they do not detract from loyalty to the state. Tolerance, Rousseau insists, quote, should be given to all religions that tolerate others so long as their dogmas contain nothing contrary to the duties of citizenship. One duty, of course, being allegiance to the civil religion. Civil religion, in other words, is the imperial cult of the modern state. Thus, civil religion enables Rousseau to provide a religious basis to the state without enlisting any particular exclusive religion to be that basis. Now note well what civil religion and toleration therefore entail. First, religious toleration is explicitly intended to limit and denature the exclusive claims of particular religions so as to bind adherents more closely to the state. In other words, a degree of intolerance is an indelible feature of tolerance, of the modern liberal notion of tolerance itself. Second, Civil religion cannot offer a standpoint from which the state itself can be criticized or challenged. Only particular religions can do that, but notice what Rousseau has done. He has stigmatized this as intolerant and hence as illegitimate. Any recourse to particular creeds as the basis for political dissent. All the avenues are blocked. It's no accident that Rousseau's insistence on the primacy of civil religion entailed a virulent hostility to Christianity. Although he pays this perfunctory tribute to the charity enjoined by the gospel at the very beginning of the, cha of the chapter, Rousseau demurs that because, quote, the Christian homeland is not of this world, the state cannot rely on the Christian's allegiance, and especially on his zeal in warfare. What clearly troubles Rousseau is that having rendered unto God, Christians, or for that matter, adherents of any other particular religion, may feel little, if any, responsibility to render unto Caesar. Rousseau's insistence on the primacy of the state in his civil religion is often considered a harbinger of totalitarianism, which allows liberals throughout the North Atlantic to persist in the belief that Locke's brand of tolerance promises religious vibrancy and democratic dissent. Well, let me disillusion you about this. Recall that Locke excludes two groups from the charmed circle of tolerance, Catholics and atheists. Catholics, Locke's, Locke reasons, entrust themselves to, quote, the protection and service of another prince, <clears throat> while atheists cannot be trusted to keep promises, contracts, or covenants which form the bonds of human society because, since they don't believe in God, they lack any fear of divine retribution. 
In other words, tolerance has limits. And those limits appear to be defined for Locke, as for Rousseau and for later liberal thinkers from John Stuart Mill to John Rawls, in terms of allegiance to the state and social harmony. Now, if you want evidence that modern liberal democracies do indeed have civil religions, look no further than your own homeland. Scholars of, Amer of religion in America, such as Martin Marty and Robert Bella, have written extensively about what Marty dubs religion in general, exemplified by President Dwight Eisenhower's famous and utterly fatuous declaration in 1954 that, quote, not making this up, America is founded on a deep religious faith, and I don't care what it is. <laughs> Their civil religion. Bella, who by the way passed, who passed away last month, authored a renowned essay entitled Civil Religion in America, which he defined as, quote, an institutionalized collection of sacred beliefs about the American nation. The American civil religion, he contended, consists of a theological and devotional ensemble of creeds, prayers, rituals, and doctrines, especially American exceptionalism the conviction that God has given Americans a special mission or destiny to spread freedom around the world. A self-righteous delusion, I would add, uh, that lies at the root of global suspicion and antipathy toward the United States, much of which has taken religiously intolerant forms. In the American civil religion, it is considered at best impolite and worst intolerant to advance the claims of a particular religion over against those of another particular religion or against the American civil religion itself. The point I want to emphasize is that Rousseau's account of civil religion and of, the, and of the pivotal role played by tolerance in that religion suggests that the alleged secularity of modern political orders, one crucial element of which is their tolerance of and neutrality toward religious difference, is itself a form of the sacred. As Simon Critchley contends, Liberal democracy represents one form of what he calls the metamorphosis of the sacred. The displacement and transferal of sacral devotion, once given to particular religions, to the modern state. Tolerance, in other words, helps to give us a moral and political culture in which it is considered barbarous to kill in the name of Christ or Allah or Yahweh, but it is considered acceptable and even glorious to kill in the name of the United States of America. You must not crusade for your deity with weapons. If you do, you'll land in jail. But if you crusade for America with F-15s or Tomahawk missiles, you'll be awarded with accolades, medals, and munitions contracts. Well, let me talk about those munitions contracts for a moment. They point to another part of the history of tolerance, namely capitalism and the global marketplace. It's not coincidental that capitalism was born around the same time as the modern state and religious tolerance. Let's go back to Locke, who in the same year that he published his Reflections on Toleration also published his two treatises of government, where in the second treatise, which is probably best known to undergraduates, he explores more intensively that realm of outward things that the civil magistrate and not religion should govern. Now like many forward-looking Englishmen of his time, Locke was vexed by the retrograde subsistence agriculture practiced by, by peasants and tenants. The land, he claims, hath no improvement of pasturage, tillering, tilling, or planting. Now Locke lamented this lack of improvement, as he called it, because we were, he writes, sent into the world by his, that's a capital H, order, and about his capital H business. And Locke does mean business. He argues that property ownership is justified not, as you're often told, by mixing one's labor with the earth. That's wrong. It's justified by improvement, as he calls it, by which he clearly means profitable investment and production. So lest you think that the historical conception of capitalism was immaculate, let me assure you that thinkers such as Locke, with their commitments to improvement, provided sanctions for the forcible and often bloody dispossession of Irish, Native Americans, and other colonized people from their land on the grounds that they were not improving it. The same Locke who advocates religious toleration in, in such sweetly reasonable terms is the same Locke who, are, who offers arguments for transacting his business, the accumulation of money, lands, houses, furniture, and the like. And because religion, in his view, must not concern itself with those outward things. 
Religious objections to the dispossession and genocide that accompanied improvement cannot be leveled. The religious character of capitalism and its connection to religious tolerance is even more vividly displayed by Voltaire in his philosophical letters, an account of his visit to England in the late, in the late 1720s. This is the country of sects, he writes. An Englishman goes to heaven by whatever road he pleases. Why, Voltaire asks, is a Frenchman subjected to the Catholic Church? Has tolerance been so successful in England? Because it's good for business, he concludes. In the sixth letter, Voltaire describes his visit to the London Stock Exchange. Go to that place more venerable than any court, Voltaire writes, and you will see the representatives of all nations assembled there for the profit of mankind. There, he continues, the Jew, the Mohammedan, and the Christian deal with one another as if, and here's the crucial line, as if they were of the same religion and reserve the name of infidel for those who go bankrupt. As Voltaire suggests in the religion of the marketplace, the key distinction is the possession, or not, of money, not of virtue or saintliness or doctrinal orthodoxy. By once again restricting religion to an internal or private sphere, tolerance allows the market to operate without the friction that might be caused by religious objections to avarice or injustice, which, if they were taken seriously, could at the very least lead to regulations or prohibitions of market activity, and possibly even raise objections to capitalism itself. Moreover, as Voltaire's remark implies, capitalism itself assumes certain religious qualities. Adherents of different religions encounter each other, quote, as if they were of the same religion, and the definitions of orthodoxy and heresy, virtue and vice, saint and sinner, turn on money. Quote, the name of infidel, remember, is for those who go bankrupt. When Marx later referred to money as the, quote, God among commodities, he was arguably engaging in much more than mere metaphor. This latest phase of capitalism, usually dubbed globalization, has ironically weakened or crippled the secular nationalism, which for, was for a long time considered its in, in, inseparable partner. The processes that have uh, been making for this erosion are so familiar to us now as to be almost banal. The worldwide reach of transnational corporations, the erosion of national identities through immigration, mass media and communications technologies, the spread of American popular culture through television, film, music, and the internet, and the rise of multicultural societies through the diasporas of peoples and cultures, all of these make it harder to define the people of a particular nation. In post-colonial nations where the secular nationalisms that emerged after World War II have weakened or collapsed or disappeared, religious nationalisms, often but not always Islamist, have rushed to fill the political space that was once occupied by liberalism or revolutionary socialism. Among Muslims and Pentecostals, in particular, the two most rapidly growing religious groups in the world, Marx and Engels have yielded the historical stage to Muhammad and the Holy Ghost. Because in part of their proudly proclaimed intolerance, these religious movements are often maligned as anti-modern. But I'm not sure that's the right way to characterize them. Islamist movements, for instance, attract support not just from the poor and dispossessed, but also from many educated and technically trained professionals. Religious terrorist organizations are often comprised of believers of many nationalities who move from place to place with no obvious national agendas or allegiances. The purveyors of contemporary religious intolerance, I think, are not so much opposed to modernity and globalization as they are determined to create a modernity and globalization of their own design, one that reflects their own convictions. This is not a clash of civilizations, as Samuel Huntington once put it. I think it's more like what Tariq Ali has dubbed a clash of fundamentalisms. A liberal market fundamentalism, represented by the United States, and a religious fundamentalism, represented but not exhausted by Islamism, each offering a version of modernity and globalization. Still, you could say, our kind of modernity, the supposedly tolerant and nonviolent sort, is clearly superior and the rest of the world just has to get on board. 
Based on the genealogy, genealogy I just traced of both capitalism and the nation state, my response would be that toler tolerance is both impossible and undesirable. Both the nation state and capital are intolerant of anything that inhibits either devotion to the state or the unfettered motion of the market. I'm also alluding to the subtle and covert coercion that always lurks behind any regime of tolerance. An oft unrecognized theme in the vaunted history of religion in America is a Protestant cultural authority that was never shy about imposing itself. Even though there has never been any official religious establishment in our national history since the early days of the Republic, there has been a moral or cultural establishment. For most of the time, Christianity, and especially Protestant Christianity, that was the largely unchallenged basis for law and public policy. This establishment has been so pervasive and enduring that we seldom realize its very existence. And we don't reflect on how it calls into question our historical commitment to tolerance. This isn't the venue to rehearse the story of religious freedom in America, but it's not well known, for instance, that the establishment clauses of the First Amendment were not interpreted to apply to the states until the 1940s. This explains why states often, pub often provided public funds for churches, why overtly Christian prayers could be required in public schools, why blasphemy and Sabbath violations could be prosecuted. And that's not to mention the illiberal and sporadically violent conduct of Protestants toward Catholics and Mormons throughout the 19th century. <clears throat> I think there's also a certain disingenuousness built into the concept of tolerance itself. For as much as we in liberal democracies have learned to smile or shudder at claims about truth or goodness or evil, I would hope that educated and humane people everywhere, you look like educated and humane people, consider a long roster of beliefs to be demonstrably untrue and stupid and pernicious, and that we should stop according them tolerance on the grounds that they are faith-based and therefore deserving of respect. The flatness of the earth, the creation of the world in six days, 6,000 years ago, the genetic superiority of whites over others, the right of men to lord it over women, the denial of the Holocaust, AIDS as divine punishment on homosexuals. All of these and other dimwit, odious beliefs have been propagated on faith-based grounds. You know, I didn't have uh, much in common on religion with the late journalist Christopher Hitchens, but one thing I have to say that I agree with 100% is that all you have to do in this country is have reverend or its uh, equivalent in front of your name and you can say and do anything stupid and outrageous. Even those who celebrate diversity do not celebrate the marvelous diversity of ways to be misogynist or fascist or homophobic. They do not and should not extend any inclusivity to the Taliban or neo-Nazis or neo-Confederates or the Ku Klux Klan or Holocaust deniers. All of which is to say that tolerance, I think, fosters a habit of intellectual laziness inattention or indifference to the particularity, benign or malevolent, of beliefs and ways of life. In the name of peaceful coexistence, it forces us to evade or trivialize matters of truth and falsehood, goodness and evil, commitment and repudiation, matters crucial to any real peace and harmony that's more than just lack of violence. Tolerance also compels us to be facile and dishonest pretending to believe things that we don't really believe. It produces limpid and decaffeinated assertions, such as, I believe that Jesus Christ is our savior, or that Allah is great and merciful, but that's just my personal opinion. Can you imagine Reverend King 50 years ago you know, telling the marchers in Washington, I have a dream, but it's just my personal dream. You don't have to share it. I don't want to offend anybody. No great moral or political revolutions have enter, ever been achieved with such cowardly and insipid language. It renders us hesitant to acknowledge and examine the differences and incongruities among religions, which cannot be simply blithely ignored or settled with mutual understanding. And despite its appearance of cheerful broad-mindedness, tolerance makes us patronizing, and it makes us parochial in the worst sense of the word. It's a way of talking down to those of other faiths who are tolerated, not engaged, and it also allows us, therefore, to continue insulated 
from challenge or criticism. I suspect that much of the reluctance to abandon tolerance stems from two sources. There's the completely legitimate fear that religious difference unmanaged by tolerance would quickly degenerate into acrimony and bloodshed. I certainly don't dismiss that fear. But I would also say that it rests on the assumption that it's fundamentally impossible for those of different faiths to communicate and share a common world. The reluctance also stems from the related idea that if religious communities are to communicate, we need some kind of theory that translates differences and manages conversation across religious boundaries. Lacking such a theory, people in liberal societies become fearful and inarticulate in the face of awkward and painful disagreement and so reflexively fall back on tolerance, which at least appears to offer a way not only to avoid violence, but to navigate religious difference with some degree of civility. If, as I sometimes think, liberalism is the politics of people who are trying to remain impervious to contact with each other, any virtue beyond tolerance has to be rooted in the realization that a genuine encounter with religious difference can disrupt, wound, transform, and liberate us. It can force us not only to recognize and become vulnerable to the reality of people not like ourselves, but to awaken from our own dogmatic slumbers, even to explore our own religious commitments more deeply and thoroughly. Such a disruptive encounter with religious difference is an occasion, therefore, to cultivate a much more capacious and resilient generosity that is at once moral and intellectual and spiritual. The alternative I would propose then is something that is neither passive and condescending nor aggressive and domineering. Peaceableness, one could call it, or perhaps an active tolerance, if you will, an ethic or an etiquette of religious dialogue that is engaging, charitable, patient, and humble. Engaging in the dialogue requires us to learn about religious others with whom we share social and political space. And I don't think we need a theory to do this. Charitable in that we permit others to speak publicly in their own terms and not in some religious pablum or Esperanto. Patient in that we both allow for the possibility of misunderstanding and practice the arduous civility, arduous civility of contestation and disagreement. And humble in that we are willing to be challenged vigorously by people who do not believe as we do and not take it as some personal or intolerant assault. Given our Constantinian history and our discomfort with difference that can't be readily assimilated or celebrated, I suspect that patience and humility are going to be the hardest virtues for Christians and especially American Christians to learn. But I don't think this is an utterly utopian ideal. In fact, we have something like it in the historical record. I'm talking about medieval Islamic Spain, where from the late 8th to the late 15th century, Muslims, Christians, and Jews achieved an always precarious, but nonetheless real culture of conflict, intermingling, and flourishing. While the Muslim conquest of Spain brought great carnage and destruction, Christians and Jews, or where am I? Oh yeah, Christians and Jews were offered peace in return for accepting subjugation paying what amounted to a protection tax, and showing an at least nominal deference to their Muslim rulers. Jews, in particular, seem to have actually welcomed the Muslims as an alternative to the Visigoths. Over the next seven centuries, members of all three faiths created a common Arabic culture. Christians and Jews rose to prominence in Muslim government and society. Andalusia came to be seen by Christians in Northern Europe as the intellectual center of the continent especially the city of Cordoba, which was dubbed the ornament of the world. Inspired by the Arabs' reverence for their holy language, Jews, who both spoke and wrote Arabic, undertook intensive study of their own holy language, Hebrew. In the 10th century, Cordoba's library held half a million volumes. At the same time, the largest Christian library held no more than 400. That's 400, not 400,000. The Jewish synagogue in Toledo features inscriptions covered in Arabic as well as in Hebrew. 
Muslim, Jewish, and Christian philosophers debated one another in formal public settings. One of those philosophers, Averroes, or Ibn Rushdi, was a renowned commentator and translator of Aristotle who influenced both Moses Maimonides, another resident of Cordoba, and Thomas Aquinas, who referred to him fondly as the commentator. All of this came to an end, alas, over the 15th century, destroyed by Muslims from North Africa and Christians from Northern Europe, both insistent on pristine orthodoxy. When Ferdinand and Isabella expelled from Spain all Jews and Muslims who refused to convert, the ornament of the world became a memory. Now, I'm not holding up medieval Spain or Cordoba as some kind of a model for today. It was not a paradise of kumbaya. The Muslims held a sword in their velvet gloves. Medieval Spain was racked by infighting among Islamic sects, which often led to numerous instances of persecution and massacre and martyrdom. And the Muslims, Christians, and Jews of the time did not believe in liberal tolerance. They had not read John Locke. Yet they still managed to create a flourishing and relatively peaceable civilization. I'd like to conclude by holding out as an example someone who has long been, for me, a precious guide in the Catholic Christianity from which I inevitably address these issues, and that's the Trappist monk Thomas Merton. In addition to being one of the first prominent Catholics to prophesy against the war crimes in Vietnam, Merton was a courageous and erudite crosser of religious boundaries. He was an interlocutor with D.T. Suzuki, Thich Nhat Hanh, and other Buddhist monks and intellectuals. Merton exemplifies the ensemble of virtues I've recommended as an alternative to tolerance. In fact, he died suddenly in 1968 while he was attending a conference of Buddhist monks in Bangkok. In a book entitled Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, Merton muses on a question posed by Gandhi. How can he who thinks he possesses absolute truth be fraternal? Now this is Merton. The problem, colon. God has revealed himself to men in Christ, but he has revealed himself, first of all, as love. Absolute truth is then grasped as love, therefore not in such a way that it excludes love. Only he who loves can be sure that he is still in contact with the truth, which is in fact too absolute to be grasped by his mind. Hence, he who holds to the gospel truth is afraid that he may lose the truth by a failure of love, not by a failure of knowledge. In that case, he is humble, and therefore he is wise. But scientia inflat, that's Latin for knowledge puffs one up or inflates one, makes one proud. Knowledge expands a man like a balloon and gives him a precarious wholeness in which he thinks that he holds in himself all the dimensions of a truth, the totality of which is denied to others. It then becomes his duty, he thinks, by virtue of his superior knowledge, to punish those who do not share his truth. How can he love others, he thinks, except by imposing on them the truth which they would otherwise insult and neglect? This is the temptation. To extend Merton's metaphor here, it's precisely when such a man seeks to punish and impose that eventually the balloon of his pride and vanity bursts, leaving him shriveled and empty. What prevents such a sorry fate for both him and those he seeks to dominate? Love. Revealed, Merton still believes in Christ, but not wholly contained in any man. So where God is worshiped in love, your way is his way. And humility, which to Merton is a form of wisdom. When so many vainglorious believers are calling for blood, ashes, and ruin, the old truths of love and humility might still be the virtues that save the day. As anyone who believes in a crucified and resurrected political criminal can tell you, stranger things have happened. Thank you. <laughs>